Good evening. Welcome to the first Hogue Health Center, Huntington Beach, virtual physician panel. I am thrilled to share this podium with two distinguished colleagues and physicians of mine. Dr. Amit Hiteshi, he is an internal medicine specialist at the Huntington Beach Clinic. And we also are fortunate to have Dr. Damian Richardson, a dynamic orthopedic surgeon. And our job is to share with you how we go about balancing the medical care and the concerns about the coronavirus as we are returning to this new normal. We would like to show you a brief overview of the topics we like to cover. And before I do that, I'd like to ask Dr. Hiteshi first and then Dr. Richardson to introduce themselves. Dr. Hiteshi, welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's amazing to be a part of this panel uh, with two respected physicians. Uh, my name is Amit Hiteshi. I work at the Hogue Huntington Beach Health Center. I'm an internal medicine physician. I work on the second floor here and it's an honor to be here. Fantastic, and Dr. Richardson. So my name is uh, Damian Richardson. I'm an orthopedic surgeon with the Newport Orthopedic Institute. Uh, I work out of Huntington Beach as well um, on the third floor uh, and I have offices uh, in uh, Newport Beach as well. Welcome to both of you. Uh, let me take you through the agenda for this evening's panel. Go to the next slide. So I myself am a plumber and also a cardiologist. I run the cardiac cath laboratories at the Jeffrey M. Carlton Heart and Vascular Institute. And I have the privilege of managing the Joel Manchester Endowed Chair. We have seen tremendous challenges over the um, past three months with regards to the coronavirus pandemic. It's unprecedented from the world coming down to the local individual homes and hospital levels. It has affected every walk of life. Healthcare has been more or less suspended. We have seen tremendous changes. And as we go through this, we have safely uh, processed to returning to the new normal. We followed the CDC national guidelines. HOG has implemented a number of safety protocols to ensure the safety of the patients and the provider staff during this transition. We screen all who enter the Hogue Health Center Hunting Beach building, uh, patients and the staff without exception. If someone is walking in and they didn't have a face covering, we offer them and we also tell them why it is so important to have that covering. The Coronavirus spreads not just by droplets, but also by tiny aerosol particles that are not visible to the naked eye and the face masks have clearly shown to reduce the number of cases. And the most important, thorough cleaning of the exam rooms and the equipment between the patient usage. The message here from all three of us is not to delay the care. During the pandemic, we have seen, sadly, the number of heart attacks, strokes, uh, gastrointestinal bleeding, and other emergency cases. They have plummeted. Many of the patients are afraid to go to the hospitals or call medical care, and they stayed at home and suffered. We implore all of you if any of these symptoms present that would be suggestive of a heart attack, stroke, or a change in the color of the urine or the stool, they need to seek attention immediately. The emergency room is completely safe. 
they have protocols in place and they should be comfortable in calling 911. If you have a concern for cancer, we ask you to contact the HOPE, your primary care physician. Remember, early detection leads to better outcomes. Time is life in this scenario. Those of those with the chronic conditions, you should maintain continuous follow-up cares with your group of physicians and nurse practitioners and hospitals. If you have any healthcare concern or not feeling well, you should immediately reach out to your physician. And we have instituted telehealth. Hope many physician offices offer video telephone visits. They are approved by all the insurance companies. This is in addition to the in-person visit. In this regard, I'll be discussing with my panel members when to select a telehealth as an option as opposed to an in-person visit. What visits are really essential where you need to be in person? And how do you prepare for a telehealth visit so the time is most useful for you? We're here ready to care for you. Hulk Health Center, Hunting Beach Services, and physician offices are all open. We have a comprehensive services in one safe location that is very convenient. This includes the urgent care, imaging center, breast center, heart and vascular imaging, laboratory services, Hogue Medical Group physicians on two floors, physician specialist offices, that includes cardiology, orthopedics, oncology, neurology, dermatology, pulmonary, and more. So you have a website down there for any of the complete list of services that are mentioned. And last but not least, at the end, you will have an opportunity to ask questions through the chat function. So let me take you through how we want to go forward. I like to ask both Dr. Richardson first and then Dr. Hiteshi. Do you offer telehealth services for your practice and within your specialty, how did this help and where did you think telehealth is not sufficient? So we do offer telehealth in our specialty and what I found uh, works uh, great for, for me at least is uh, FaceTime. Uh, I feel like it's a uh, app that everybody is use, used to, uh, gives you both audio and video capabilities. Um, and um, in terms of which, uh, what was your second question? Which uh, visits are most appropriate? Yes, uh, so for uh, orthopedic surgery, I think, you know, if there's any um, acute issue, uh, a new injury, uh, infection, uh, things like that. We want to see you in person, but for telehealth, uh, telehealth is perfect for um, an established patient, uh, follow-up visits for imaging, uh, things of that nature that we can kind of just discuss results with. That is great. Um, Dr. Hiteshi, how are you using the telehealth function during this transition period? So for us, we're doing telephone visits and Zoom visits for the telehealth visits. And we're noticing that managing chronic conditions like diabetes or hypertension can be done very well using this. And in a way, I wish I was able to do this even prior to COVID because it's really managing diet, lifestyle, and A1C numbers for diabetes and adjusting medications accordingly. Similarly, looking at blood pressure numbers and adjusting medications and encouraging lifestyle changes like exercise to treat that. But with new symptoms, like Dr. Richardson said, um, new symptoms maybe of shortness of breath or uh, pain that we have not evaluated first, it's really nice to see the person face-to-face uh, -face so that we can make an accurate diagnosis and help them further. For those who are starting out on this telehealth journey, how do you educate them in terms of initiating a telehealth call? Uh, Dr. Hiteshi first and then Dr. Richardson. 
Well, because it's so new to all of us, I think it's been a learning process. Um, a lot of times we're coming with information that may be relevant or irrelevant to the visit from a patient perspective. So over time, I've learned that um, organizing the medications has been really helpful to start the visit. And then depending on which problem or issue that we're discussing, organizing the timeline of events can be helpful what things make something better or worse, and just really getting a good grasp uh, from a patient perspective so that they can tell a story to us has been helpful. A lot of times we can redirect and we've been able to do that both on the phone or in a televisit, just like we would do in an in-person visit. Um, but I think overall we've seen really successful visits for especially chronic conditions during this time. And from, Dr. Richardson. Yeah, so from an orthopedic perspective, I think, first of all, uh, it's good to make sure all your equipment is working uh, and uh, that, uh, you know, you've, you've actually uh, uh, had a, had a pre-visit call, perhaps, from one of our staff to make sure things are teed up. Um, and then from orthopedic uh, physical exam, making sure there's good lighting in the room, that, uh, you know, we can see uh, exactly what the problem is and you you've thought about some of your symptoms uh, prior to that. One thing I have noticed in our three months of telehealth practice is we have seen more ceilings of the houses than I have ever seen. And some of my patients initially weren't aware that just as I can see them, they can see me and some of them forget and we kind of caution them. Make sure you dress appropriately and you're seated in an area where it is presentable in addition to good lighting and preferably sound shielding to a degree. We tell them to make sure they check their pulse and blood pressure if possible, have a list of medications available right next to them to make the best use of the telehealth. I have a question. Uh, from each of your practices, um, I know you touched on that a little bit, uh, Damien, uh, are there patients with conditions that they should definitely come to the clinic in-person visit and telehealth is not appropriate at all. Yes, uh, you know, with regards to the post-operative visits, the, the first post-operative visit is, is, is very important for us to uh, make an assessment of how things are healing. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, acute injuries, things that are new, uh, a change in your status or your health that has a uh, led to you know, a decrease uh, uh, mobility or um, activities of daily living. Those are the things we wanna see sooner than later before uh, time goes by. Um, and then anything that has to do with uh, infection, um, that's, that's kind of hard to really get a good hold of sometimes based on the, the camera, the lighting, um, you know, unless we're there in person and we can see it, uh, touch it and feel and um, make our assessment. Hey, Tashi. You know, there's such a broad range of things that we see, so it's really hard to make a general statement. But in general, if someone feels like they could have a visit with us in a couple of days and their condition wouldn't get worse, that's something we feel comfortable probably seeing over the phone or in a virtual visit. But if things are getting worse and they're getting worse rapidly, we would definitely want to see them in person or redirect them to an urgent care or emergency room. I'll give you an example. If someone has chronic asthma, even though they're short of breath, I can still do a virtual visit with them and try to help them manage their asthma. It's something that they've had before. It's something that they're aware of and that they can treat on their own and they're not scared of. But if that is a new asthmatic patient who's never experienced it and it's in the setting of an infection, for example, and it's a bronchitis and the bronchioles are not doing well in terms of oxygenating, that's something I wanna see in person because I wanna be able to put my stethoscope on their lungs and direct care appropriately. So we have established that telehealth is a good bridge, but there are many that a patient needs to come to the clinic or the hospital to have the visit, to have the testing and treatment. So if someone is fearful, afraid of the catching an infection, how both of you are changing your appointments, precautions, 
your environment? How are you preparing for that visit to make sure that visit is safe for them? I'll take that one first. Uh, so uh, for, at our clinic, everyone that comes to, uh, to our office is pre-screened with a questionnaire uh, and their temperature is taken um, before they enter the building. Uh, we do practice social distancing within our office uh, with the seating arrangement um, you know, within each clinic pod. Uh, and wearing a mask is uh, required by all staff. So uh, you'll, you'll see from, you know, from uh, administrative to, to every clinician and our, our ancillary staff uh, are wearing masks and uh, gloves during the exam. Um, does that answer your question? You have definitely. And uh, Dr. Hiteshi, what do you do in terms of the office? How is the staff preparing the environment? You know, so the good news is that even prior to COVID, we were doing a really good job of having a protocol for cleaning. So we haven't really had to change that much. We've created rooms that are specific for suspected COVID cases so that those rooms can be dedicated to that and cleaned appropriately. Uh, just like Dr. Richardson mentioned, downstairs, we before someone even enters the building, they're screened for uh, any symptoms and then their temperature is taken. They come upstairs and there's appropriate tape to make a physical distance so that everyone is uh, safely uh, distant from each other. And then when they come back in here, they're accompanied by staff and placed in a room. The whole time, everyone around them has a mask. But I think the real big point is that we also don't want to get COVID and we're coming to work. So that means we've set up this environment in a way where we also feel safe. So if we feel safe coming to work, I think people can also feel safe coming to our workplace. Very well said. I like to add as the months are getting hotter in the summer and we have a method where we expect the patients to come in and wait in the parking lot in their cars. We time it so they come about five to 10 minutes before their scheduled visit. And we have lightened our schedule. So there aren't a large number of patients coming and waiting. We don't double book. And when they're waiting in the car, we ask them to lower the windows, make sure there's cross ventilation in the car. As you know, the car temperature rises. And when you come into the clinic and we check the temperature, it's not uncommon the temperature is high. We have them sit in the cool room a couple of minutes and then recheck the temperature and it routinely comes down. So something to remember this. Let me ask you in a different question. Um, if physicians are comfortable coming to the clinics, going to the hospitals, seeing patients and doing the procedures, what further can the hospitals do in terms of their environment, um, the surgical or non-surgical? Uh, how is the hospitals uh, making sure that they are taken care of and the precautions are taken? Uh, so I'll take that from a surgical um, perspective. Uh, we've, you know, we've instituted uh, COVID testing for all of our elective cases. So. Um, and there's a five-day um, uh, uh, pre-screen time where you're tested and you're asked to kind of quarantine yourself uh, until your results come back before, um, you know, you come to the, the, the surgery suite. So uh, that protects our staff and our patients. Um, other thing is uh, uh, surrounding um, visit visitors. We don't allow visitors uh, to come in and out with the patients. Um, so... Uh, from that perspective. And then in the ORs, uh, if you are uh, COVID unknown or a person under investigation, as the CDC would like to say, uh, we, take pro we take extra precautions around intubation uh, period uh, where, you know, the virus can be aer aerosolized um, and we wait for the, um, the ventilation system to clear the air in the room. And that takes time. That takes time. And it's, it, it does um, slow down the process uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the surgery and, and, but it's all worth it though, because we, we're having great success. And Dr. Hiteshi, what are your thoughts on this? 
So just like in the outpatient setting, we've created dedicated rooms for people who are suspected COVID in the hospital. They've also done the same thing by creating divisions in that regard. So I think that's one really nice added benefit during this time. So that's one of the things that I know that they've taken care of. I wanna to add to this, um, the emergency rooms and the urgent cares at Hogue Health System have uh, been trained to look for the symptoms, screening questions, and then test the temperature and they triage them appropriately. At Newport Beach, uh, Hogue Hospital, there is a screening tent outside. So if there is any concern, that patient is separated from others who don't have those symptoms. So there is really no reason to delay at this moment for any condition. The delay can be disastrous. We have seen a tremendous number of heart attack, stroke patients suffering these events at home and now we're beginning to see those patients coming back. Many of them have had the heart attack symptoms already coming three to four days before, and which is a sad commentary. We wanna take this opportunity to assure them that please come early. We would rather you be safe, get tested, proven that it is not a heart attack, not a stroke, rather than stay at home when things really get worse. In this regards to this balancing the coronavirus fear and the fear of a delayed diagnosis, is this where perhaps a telehealth may be an anxiety reducing event? Have you noticed that to be the case? Sure, so this uh, past few months, I've definitely noticed an increase in the amount of medications that I'm prescribing for insomnia, for depression and for anxiety. And I think just having that established telehealth visit where the person is seeing me and talking to me, understanding that the community at large is going through some of the same things that the patient themselves is going through, just verbalizing that to me has taken a load off of the person itself. And I think given them a little bit of peace. Um, it's also provided me an opportunity to engage with the patients and remind them of the lifestyle things that they were doing prior to COVID that might have fallen back into the list of things to do, thinking that this COVID situation is potentially gonna get better in a day or a week or a month. But the fact is we might be in this situation for some time. So it's time to start planning around COVID and act like it's gonna be here. So getting back to a routine and reminding the patient that they need to establish this routine. So Monday doesn't blend into Tuesday to blend into the weekend. I think I've noticed that my patients who have a daily routine are doing much better with coping with this than patients who are not. And so that would be one thing to take home from this, this video panel that we're doing is create a daily schedule that incorporates all the lifestyle things that you think will help you with anxiety, such as guided meditations, exercise, anti-inflammatory eating with lots of fruits and vegetables that are fresh, and keep that as part of your toolkit to fight anxiety during this time. Well said. Dr. Uh, Richardson, I have a question. Um, what are the consequences of not seeking care for orthopedic injuries and complaints? Uh, what, what could go wrong? So uh, like many things in medicine, uh, uh, orthopedic injuries uh, are, are time sensitive and how you treat them um, uh, and the healing process, uh, they, they typically happen at predictable uh, intervals. Um, and uh, we know with fracture healing, you know, what happens, when do we start movement? When do we start mobilizing? When do we start weight bearing? Uh, and if you miss these appointments, we miss that data point to, to assess and then to redirect sometimes when the healing process, you know, everybody's different. The healing process isn't going, doesn't follow the standard timeline. It's, it's, it's set up in a certain way, but sometimes I'll see them at two weeks and I'm like, oh, I need to see you again. Uh, instead of the six week mark, the four week mark. And um, you, if you miss these appointments, uh, whether through telehealth or through personal in-person visits, then it could have uh, lead to complications or um, uh, I guess not the best outcome. I like to add from the cardiology perspective, we have had patients with heart attacks coming late 
to the point we are seeing damages to their heart and muscle that we have not seen in a decade because we have been successful with a community health education, time is muscle, time is brain. They are used to coming early. They're used to calling the paramedics right away. But in this coronavirus epidemic, we have had patients where their heart valve is torn apart or the middle partition between the right heart and the left heart blew out, creating a hole in the heart. These type of complications traditionally are very uncommon and we're beginning to see this. So the consequences of not getting the care or getting the care late can make a difference between life and death. In that regard, one of the questions that people often ask, look, we were told to do social distancing and my grandparents are in nursing homes and they can't see each other. How do you keep in touch? Social distancing doesn't mean and shouldn't mean social isolation. What can we as physicians do to encourage the family members? What kind of message can we give? How do we tell them to check in? So isolation itself is a risk factor for heart attack and stroke. And they've compared isolation as a risk factor equivalent to light smoking or obesity for heart disease. So this is definitely something that shouldn't linger. We shouldn't have isolation as part of a risk factor for something that can be so devastating like heart attacks. Um, I've encouraged my patients to check in with their family members, uh, whether it's every other day or daily through telephone and through video to limit those conversations to things that are other than COVID. So the first five to 10 minutes of these discussions should be outside of COVID. And if you mention the word COVID, you have to do 10 sit-ups or 10 push-ups because there's, there was life before COVID and there's life after COVID. And we need to rejuvenate and bring out that life that exists. So I recommend staying in touch through some sort of means. That's the beauty of technology when used right. Yeah, I see um, quite a few of my patients um, uh, who sometimes come in without family um, because of the, the skilled nursing facility, the, the policies regarding transportation. Um, but I just encourage those family members to reach out to uh, that facility and, and see, you know, who, what, what, what are the rules, what are the policies, uh, and interact as much as possible. And to be present at the visit as well, because many of my patients, they, some have dementia, some have you know, different uh, cognitive problems that, you know, it, it's good to have family there uh, to help uh, ease that visit and make the visit more productive. I'd like to ask to reflect on your own personal lives. Uh, how did the coronavirus impact you, your practice style, and how you're interacting with your family? And how are you telling them about their anxiety? Well, uh, with regards to my practice, uh, it, it's, 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 uh, it's certainly changed the interaction, the dynamic between um, the physician and the patient. Uh, when you're behind a mask, it's, it's hard to read somebody's body language. And I, I've been told that I, I'm not as big as I used to be, but uh, if I'm not smiling, I might be kind of intimidating sometimes. Um, and uh, I think that's hard to not have that, uh, those social cues um, or to be able to shake somebody's hand. I think the days of shaking somebody's hand are probably long gone. Um, uh, so uh, that, that it has changed um, that. And we lose, we lose um, I think part, one of the tools in our toolbox is physicians while we come to this practice, right? Uh, in terms of making a change in somebody's life. Uh, with regards to my family, um, my wife, uh, she's, she's kind of mad at me because we're like, uh, you know, uh, hard to say, but we have a scarlet letter because I'm on the front line, I feel like sometimes, um, for people who are social distancing, they know I'm a physician, but um, it's, it's, it's been hard. Um, and I remind my, my family that this is, this is something this is, I'm dedicated to and I'm passionate about. 
Uh, and I think they gather behind, my, my family gathers behind me and um, support me. Wonderful. Amit, I have a question, Dr. Hiteshi. Touch is so magical and touch heals people. How are you managing with other ways to convey that empathy and support when that touch is gone? It's a great question. Uh, when it comes to the virtual visits, it's been really, really interesting to get into people's houses. So in the home, people tend to feel more comfortable. They're more at ease. So I'm actually getting more of their personality doing some of these Zoom videos. And in the Zoom videos, you get to see some artwork that they have displayed on their wall or photographs of their grandchildren or family members. So I've been able to connect on that level, you know, just reflecting on why they chose that art piece or what their family's up to. So for the video visits, that's, that's been wonderful. On the in-person side, I think uh, I've been using different ways. So uh, sticking out my leg and having the other person kick um, and getting a laugh out of that as a new handshake has been helpful. Um, just starting with how the person has been feeling during this time, what they're up to, how their job has been going has really opened up that venting that people want to do at the beginning of the visit. And then that eases the whole visit and I think brings that relationship closer. So that's what I've been doing and noticing. I've noticed something interesting and I think the ma mask technology needs to evolve to become completely transparent. Several of my patients, because of the hearing difficulty, they do lip reading and that is missing. The speech is directional, and uh, this telehealth visits, one of the problems is not able to see. I mean, we're in a strange world. Where when, Did you ever imagine that you can wear a mask and go to the bank and ask for money? Yet we are in that scenario now. There is a question on the chat, and i like to ask Dr. Hitechi, should I continue pediatric care for my kids during this pandemic, such as vaccines? Should the routine for the vaccines remain the same or should we take a holiday? That's a great question. So I'll preface it with the fact that I'm not a pediatrician, but um, we do have pediatric care upstairs and they're functioning fully and they're taking similar precautions to the ones that we're taking. In fact, they're probably taking the exact same precautions because they're in the same building. And I know that people are not delaying care for their kids because uh, COVID is not the only thing that exists right now. The vaccines protect about against certain conditions that will remain present. And so being ahead of the curve is what we're trying to achieve in medicine. Preventative care is what we're trying to achieve. And so if you can keep those visits, I would really recommend them. I would add to that great comment. There is an increasing trend, both children and adults, non-COVID diseases to grow because the, the coronavirus, it has created a pause button in the healthcare monitoring and treatment of every other condition. So this is a very important message for a public health level we need to give. Coronavirus may be coming back, may not be coming back, but life must go on to its fullest extent. And we are here for you. So on that note, I'd like to ask both of you to give some parting words. Uh, any final thoughts and comments and uh, starting with Dr. Richardson? Sure, just want to say that uh, it's a pleasure being a part of the whole community um, and uh, looking forward to weathering this storm together. Uh, we will get past it. Uh, there are good times ahead um, and um, yeah, my, my office and my uh, our clinics are always open. Thank you. And Dr. Hiteshi. For myself, I'd just like to thank the community for doing their part in keeping the COVID outbreak intact. And I'd like to thank my fellow physicians, especially those in the urgent cares and emergency rooms that are truly putting themselves in the front lines for doing what they're doing. And I really appreciate being part of HOGUE. Thank you. And my final message, the good habits that we have learned, the uh, personal hygiene with regards to hand washing 
and cleaning the countertops of the high touch surfaces. This should continue into the coming flu season. And let's make this a reality because of this new particular health habits that have been shown to be useful in the coronavirus. Let's make the next season where the flu impact will be minimized as well.